temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope grateful and honored to be able to come and, and dwell in your presence, Father. I pray that your spirit would just fill this room tonight, Lord, and that all our songs would be, just be such a sweet sound to you tonight, Lord. We love you so much and give you this time in Jesus' name.
This study in um, Second Chronicles is, is titled, The Faithfulness of God. And oh, are we going to see the faithfulness of God tonight. And so tonight uh, is going to be the fourth of a four-part study as we've been looking at the life and the reign of, of Hezekiah, who was one of Judah's most godly and most effective kings. And so we'll draw this study in Hezekiah's life to a close. And then starting next week, we'll, we'll pick up the pace again. We've been just going one chapter a week because we really wanted to dig into Hezekiah's life, but we'll speed it up again next week. Tonight's message title is Prospering in the Midst of Tribulation. Anybody suffering some trials and tribulations in life right now? Good. I just don't want to feel alone. <laughs> But tonight we're going to see that that is a place where God works so powerfully in our lives. But it's also a place where people misunderstand what's going on and oftentimes shut their hearts off to what God is trying to accomplish, which really just assures you of having to go through that same trial or tribulation again in the future. So the goal is to learn when God is allowing us. So let's just do a quick review because it's important. If you remember, Hezekiah had a father named Ahaz who was one of the most wicked kings of Judah. And then you ask that question, like how does a, the most godly king from, come from the most wicked king? And the answer to that was found a few chapters back in that Hezekiah's mother and Hezekiah's grandfather were extremely godly people that knew, loved, and walked with the Lord, and their influence resulted in Hezekiah also being a very godly man, and probably more importantly to our studies, a godly king. He took the throne of Judah at the age of 25, and the very first thing that he did was he reopened the temple that his father Ahaz had closed, and that night when we studied that what we talked about was the equivalent of, of getting people back to church, how important it is to get people to church because that's where we worship the Lord. It's where we hear the word. It's where we hold one another accountable and stuff. And then he led the nation in genuine confession of sin that led to genuine repentance. He led the nation to observe the first Passover in over 200 years. When the feast was over, the people spontaneously started another seven days of worship and they were so impacted by that that at the end of those 14 days they went out and they destroyed all of the altars and the high places to false gods and they purified the land and then Hezekiah did something interesting we dug deep into it last week where he called for the people of Judah to return to biblical giving so that the Levites and the priests could all quit their secular jobs and go back to their full-time ministry the way God intended. And then if you look at the very last two verses of chapter 20, uh, 31, we get this summary of his life, his reign, and God's response to him. Second Chronicles 31, verses 20 and 21, it says, then, or, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. And he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. Another translation says he did it wholeheartedly. And then this last phrase, it says, so he prospered. And as I was preparing this, I couldn't help thinking of one of my, my most favorite portions of Scripture. It's the introduction to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We read, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And then look at this last phrase. And whatever he does shall prosper. So we just looked at two passages of Scripture where obedience to an application of God's word results in a person prospering. So I'm going to give you a message on prosperity tonight. You know me well. You know we're not going to get into that weirdness of prosperity. But the word up on the screen that we've looked at a couple of times already in two portions of Scripture is the Greek word saleach. You want to say it with me? You've got to roll that back of your throat as you say it. Saleach. Cool word, isn't it? It means to advance, to make progress, to succeed, or to be profitable. Now, in Hezekiah's case, we don't have any real specific details of how he prospered, but we can speculate that God was reversing all of the physical and spiritual damage done by previous kings, such as his dad Ahaz. He was moving the nation forward, whereas under Ahaz, the the nation was going backwards. They were profiting, and they were, excuse me, they were prospering. They were, they were profitable, moving forward. I started thinking about it. Is, isn't that exactly what happened when you and I got saved? We came into our salvation still reaping some of the consequences of our past choices and our sinful lifestyle. But at some point, we make this decision to make God's word our delight, And so we start reading it, and we start studying it, and more importantly, we start applying it to our lives. And then there comes a time where we realize that we're so immersed in God's Word that we make every decision based on the truths of Scripture that have been become, you know, part of us. And I don't know about your life, but in my life, when I started delighting in the Lord and walking in the ways of the Lord, I started to, to prosper. I got a Ferrari. No, I'm just joking. That's, that's not what the word really means. What means is, is that we begin to advance. You know, we begin to make progress with the Lord. We begin to be successful in the things of the Lord. Our life becomes profitable to the Lord. Our life becomes profitable to the people around us. And then we begin to see God reversing all of those natural consequences that came from our sinful choices in the past. And we we realize he's just absolutely transforming us. Now hold that thought. And we're going to go and we're going to now read the first verse of chapter 32. We'll put it up on the screen here. It says, After these deeds of faithfulness, and right there you expect it to say, the Lord gave Hezekiah a Ferrari and a big mansion and, you know, flowers were growing everywhere in the kingdom. You know, don't you just get this idea that because everything he did was was in line with the word of God and he was blessed and he was prospering, don't you get this idea that what's coming next is something super positive and great? We all do, right? Because that's what we expect. Well, it actually says here that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. Now, as I begin to explain this and develop this, I want you to turn backwards in your Bible, turn left to 2 Kings chapter 18. It's not going to be very far. So in the midst of Hezekiah's lifestyle of obedience and constant application of God's word, the world's greatest superpower, the one that recently destroyed and carried off the northern kingdom of Israel, breached Judah's borders and came in and and camped against the fortified cities that were outside Jerusalem with the intention of now conquering Judah. Sennacherib sets his sights now on Judah and Jerusalem and he begins making his way 
south. And I know somebody in the room is thinking that doesn't sound like the definition of prosperity to me. He was obedient. He's applying God's word. And Ezra just told us that he was prospering. And then Ezra turns around and says, and then Sennacherib shows up. And we're all thinking to ourselves, that really doesn't sound like any form of prosperity that I've ever heard of. And the reason for that is because we have a very worldly view of prosperity. We have a very wrong view of prosperity. We, we equate prosperity with ease and with lack of conflict and with abundance and that kind of stuff. So what happens is when we encounter any kind of trouble or opposition, especially when we've been really trying to obey God and his word, we, we now begin to feel like God isn't honoring the commitment that we've made to him. Hey, God, I'm, I'm living for you, and you let Sennacherib come and start conquering things. Now, that's best case scenario. At worst case scenario, and this happens way more often than maybe any of us want to admit, but the other side of that coin is that Christians then get mad at God for allowing something into our lives that we think is unfair. You know, God, I, I've been growing in my faith. I'm serving at church. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving and I, I'm, I'm letting you transform my life. And I walk in and my boss says, hey, we have to lay you off. You know, or you experience sickness or illness or maybe the death of a loved one or something like that. And we look up at heaven and we say, What's up with this? Chapter 32 is going to help us really grow in our response to difficult circumstances during times when we are being faithful and obedient to God because it's exactly what Hezekiah not only experienced, but then he properly navigated it. And in the end of the chapter, we're going to see that God just worked miraculously. And so let's begin, and I want to share a fact here. Hezekiah is doing everything right. He's living by the word. And Sennacherib and the Assyrians show up to conquer them. And what I want to show you is that Assyria's attack wasn't unprovoked. This isn't just one of those things that happened. 2 Kings 18, and, and I'll get there in a minute, but if you just read 2 Chronicles 32 by itself, you kind of get this impression that God's response to Hezekiah's obedience was to send Assyria to attack them. And so often we look at trials and tribulations in our life like God is re rewarding our obedience with some kind of punishment. And we get this kind of wrong impression of who God is. That is not the God we serve. So if you're here tonight and you're saying, listen, we're, we're right there, Pastor Randy. We're, we're living in this place where we really are seeking the Lord and we're walking in obedience. We, we really seem to be doing everything right and it seems like God just lets one trial after another trial after another trial. Well, welcome to my life. <laughs> you know, welcome to walking with the Lord because that's really what happens. But, but it's not that God is punishing us. Second Kings 18 gives us the rest of the story. Up on the screen, we're going to look at verses 6 through 7. It says, for he, this is Hezekiah, held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So he's living by the word of God, by the law. But then verse 7, it says, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And then we read something in 2 Kings that we don't read in 2 Chronicles and that is that Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. So if we went back a couple of chapters, what we'd see is that his father Ahaz was under attack from Syria and Israel. And they were about to conquer him. And so what Ahaz does is he sends gold and silver from the temple treasuries to the Assyrian king at that time. And he says, come help me. And the Assyrian king did come and help him. But from that moment, Judah was now yoked to Assyria as a slave nation. And Hezekiah comes and he takes the throne. 
And he says, hey, we're not supposed to be unequally yoked to these Assyrians. My dad made an alliance, but God doesn't want us to keep this. So he severed the relationship with Assyria. And that's why Assyria came and attacked them. It was actually another thing that Hezekiah did right. He's honoring the Lord by saying, I can't be unequally yoked with this non-believing nation. I can't be yoked to evil. And so he breaks that yoke. He breaks that agreement. And now the king of Assyria, the new king, Sennacherib, comes south and he says, okay, if you're not going to play by the rules that we set up before, we're just going to take you guys out. And see the, the perspective here. Oftentimes when we're suffering tribulation in the midst of obedience, it's because of our obedience. It's because we've made another decision to be obedient to the Lord and to his word, and we fall under the attack of Jesus' enemies. Just like King Hezekiah did. And if you can accept what I'm about to say, this is actually a form of biblical prosperity. You've made another decision to move forward in your walk with the Lord. You, you've made another decision to grow in obedience, and it's going to cost you something. The enemies of your God aren't just going to sit back and say, we're going to just let you grow. They come and they say, no, we're, we're going to do everything we can to ruin this obedient life that you are living. So make your way back to Second Chronicles 32. But I started thinking again, the Apostle Paul is a perfect example of this. He was at Ephesus, and he had made a commitment to come back to the city of Corinth, and they were expecting him. In fact, they were a little bit upset that Paul hadn't come back yet. And in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, he writes to them, and he gives them a bit of an explanation. And he says to them, and a great and effective door has opened for me, and there are many adversaries. Paul says, the reason I'm not there yet is because the Holy Spirit keeps opening these doors of opportunity. And every time a door of opportunity for effective ministry opens up, there's another enemy to deal with. There's another attack to deal with. There's more spiritual warfare. There's something else coming against me. And I'll just say that, you know, over the years, Kelly and I have observed that whenever God opens new doors for effective ministry for us or for the church, we just kind of gear up for the next round of spiritual attacks that are coming. We, we joke about this in our staff meetings here during the week, but you know, ever since we launched a ministry called Mercy's Choice, where a group of people from the church go down to the abortion clinic and they just pray, and they hope that their very presence there are going to turn people away from making that decision to go into the abortion clinic and, and abort a baby. When we started that ministry, we began to see such incredible spiritual attack in our lives members of our leadership team and their spouses experiencing ongoing sickness and illness and, and just constant troubles. When we decided to launch Reaching the Unreached and began doing gospel work in Muslim-majority countries, you know, the, the spiritual attack that that brought into the lives of the key members of these projects and their spouses and their kids. And to this day, we continue to fight those battles. And I think you find it to be true in your life as well. Whenever you make a decision and you say, you know what, God is calling me to do something. And all of a sudden, there's this new area of attack in your life. And you realize this is because I have experienced a great and effective door and there are many adversaries. It happened to King Hezekiah. It happened to Paul. It happens to all of us. But here's my encouragement to you. 
don't quit. Because that's exactly what the enemies of the cross want you to do. It's exactly why this spiritual war begins. If you're just a floundering Christian and you have no direction and you have no vision and you have no purpose, Satan's okay with that. But the minute that you decide, you know what, I'm going to get serious about my daily devotions, I'm going to get serious about Bible reading, I'm going to serve, all of a sudden the attacks come. And I've heard people say this. I, I have literally had people call me at the church and say, hey, PR, I need to step down from that thing I'm doing. The spiritual warfare has just gotten too intense. And I usually work really hard to talk them out of it in the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the enemy wants. Someone shout amen. amen. That is what the enemy wants. He wants us to give in. But I'll tell you something else that Kelly and I have observed over all these years of ministry is that when we experience the enemy's opposition, we're also about to experience God's wisdom and God's resources in the midst of those tribulations. Let me show you how it happened for Hezekiah. We'll look first at uh, how this attack from Sennacherib led to Hezekiah receiving God's wisdom. Verse 2. Oh my gosh, we're only in verse 2. You guys better speed up a little bit. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted with his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that ran through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, and built another wall outside. Also he repaired the millow and the city of David, and made weapons and shields in abundance. And so we all know that a huge army like the Assyrians, um, we know that they had at least 185,000 soldiers. They need daily resources in order to survive, and so God gives Hezekiah this, this two-part plan. The first part was to cut off the water supply from the area so that the Assyrians have to divide their efforts between daily provision and war. He, he gives Hezekiah this plan to keep the Assyrians busy doing things that would not keep them busy going to war. And that's just brilliant. I don't know, you know, Hezekiah is probably just saying, oh my gosh, we're in a lot of trouble, and he, Lord, help. And all of a sudden, he just gets this thought, well, listen, if all the springs were stopped up, they wouldn't have the provisions they need, and, you know, their efforts are going to be divided. So Hezekiah just goes, and he presents this plan to the leaders, and the leaders stir up a bunch of people. I just get this picture of people walking around the desert, picking up rocks and dropping them into the springs, you know. And every once in a while, when there's a trial and a tribulation, we think, okay, it's time to pull out a sword and, you know, build a chariot. And let's go to war. And God says, wait a minute. I've got something much simpler to you. Just find a bunch of people to pick up rocks and drop them down into the springs. And that's going to do so much more damage to the enemy than swinging a sword or a sling or something like that. See, God operates in the realm of this ultimate wisdom, and he gives it to those who asks. James chapter 1. And so... He goes and, and he shares his plan and, you know, they go and they stop up all the springs. But I want you to notice also here, <clears throat> beginning in verse 5, he strengthened himself, he built all the wall, he raised it to the towers, he built a second wall outside, repaired the millow in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. There's times where God gives us supernatural wisdom. And there's other times where God says, just use the sanctified common sense that I've given you. An enemy is coming against your city, and you've got a wall that's broken down. Don't just stand back and go, well, the Lord will provide. Hezekiah immediately sends a group of people to go out and not only fix the broken wall, then they built a second wall around the city, and then they go and they fortify all of their military equipment, shields and swords, and they, they prepare. 
And when God allows tri trouble and tribulation into our lives, he gives us the wisdom to navigate it, and then he also expects us just to go back to that sanctified common sense of doing the next right thing. And, and sometimes we forget about that. Trouble comes down the pike, and we say, hey, I'm not doing anything until God shows me what to do. And there's a lot of times where God has already showed us what to do. Go, go be smart. Build a wall. You know, build a weapon, something like that. And so there's two sides to it. There's the supernatural wisdom, and then there's just that plain old sanctified common sense. Second thing here, I want to talk about God's resources. Verse 6, he set the military captains over the people. He gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate, and he gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. Did you recognize the words from the book of Joshua in there? I think Hezekiah just said, man, I, I don't know what to say to all the soldiers and everybody. He just quotes, you know, some of the words from the book of Joshua about being strong and courageous and not being afraid, not being dismayed. And then he just applies it to his situation. But, but what he does is he calls together all the men who were going to go to war. And I love it that what he did is he gave them encouragement. And I want to pause here for a minute because I want to tell you a few things about Assyria that, that maybe you know, but maybe you don't. History tells us that Assyria's army was not just huge. You know, they were... They were a scary force to be reckoned with, but it wasn't the size of their military that, that made Assyria so scary. It was the fact that they were just absolutely ruthless on the battlefield. And if you've studied the Assyrians, you know that they weren't content with simply killing their enemies. What they liked to do was they liked to scare their future victims with what they did to their current victims. And so they had perfected the art of skinning human beings alive and then placing them in the sun. Can you imagine what that would be like? You'd die this slow, agonizing death. They had perfected the art of taking a sharpened pole and planting it in the ground at, a, at an angle and they would lift a human being and they would impale them right under the rib cage, skillfully and slowly impale them onto that pole. And it would take them days to die of their internal injuries. And they would just suffer and suffer. And the men of Judah knew you don't want to die at the hands of the Assyrians because they don't just kill you, they, they torture you with these slow, agonizing deaths. So Hezekiah addresses his soldiers and, and he encourages them. But look what he says. He says, for there are more with us than with him. Now, I just want you to picture this. They're looking over the gate and there's the army of Assyria and they look like locusts on the ground. And then the men of Judah kind of look around the courtyard outside the temple and they're like, we're outnumbered like a hundred to one. You know, we are no match for them as far as numbers. And then Hezekiah says, there's more with us than there are with him. And then verse 8, he says, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And Hezekiah is, is drawing on other portions of scripture and, and history of the nation when angels came to battle on behalf of the Jewish people. And he's kind of drawing this picture before his army, before they go out to war. And he's saying, don't forget the fact that the God of heaven has this host of angelic beings that are just waiting for God to say, go get them. So guys, you know, we are more than they are. And then it says, the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. I love that. They're outnumbered grossly, and yet they're encouraged by their king. 
There's a man named John Knox, and he was the man credited with leading Scotland's 16th century reformation. And he wrote these words. He said, a man with God is always the majority. Someone else used to say, God plus one is a majority, right? And so no matter what trouble God allows into your life, especially during times when you are being obedient and, and walking with him, never forget that God's reputation is on the line. God's reputation is always tied to how he responds to the trouble in the lives of his people. Does God ever leave us? Does he ever forsake us? He, he does not. And he promises trouble to us. That's not very comforting. Jesus said, in this world, you will have much tribulation. And then he said, but do not fear, I have overcome the world. And so God not only promises that his children are going to have trouble, but he promises that he's going to fight our battles when we trust in him in the midst of that trouble. So before we go on, I just want to remind all of us of like the New Testament equivalent to what Hezekiah just said to his men. Paul spoke it in Romans 8, verses 37 through 39. He says, yet in all these things, and I'll pause for a minute, that these things Paul is talking about are the trials and the tribulations and the sufferings that we go through because of the testimony of Christ. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul just did the exact same thing that Hezekiah did. He says we're facing insurmountable odds at times as Christians. But he says, the Lord is with us. He's going to fight our battles. He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. And I think it's sad that as Christians, a lot of times when we face hardship and trials and tribulations, we begin to doubt, first and foremost, God's love for us. We're going through a tough time, and I mean, have you ever done it where you're like, God, do you even love me anymore? And he's up there in heaven going, have you forgotten about the cross? Where I expressed my love for the whole world, including you, by sending my son Jesus to pay for your sin. He says, yes, I still love you. But you're going through what all Christians go through, trials and tribulations. And he says, you need to trust me. You need to never walk away from me in the midst of these things. So Hezekiah's speech caused the men of Judah to put their confidence in the Lord the way reading your Bible is supposed to cause you and I to have confidence in the Lord. Don't miss now how Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, responded. And I think this is my favorite part of our study tonight. And you'll see why. The point I'm going to make here is that during tribulations, our confidence in God will be tested. Verses 9 through 19. After this, after Hezekiah gives this amazing speech and he encourages all the guys and they're ready to go to war, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem. But he and all the forces with him laid siege against Lachish to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, and we'll pause there for a minute to kind of set the scene. So what we just read is that <clears throat> Hezekiah just gives this great speech to encourage everybody. And word gets to Sennacherib. The men of Judah are ready to fight. Their king has rallied them. And they're trusting in their God, even though the odds are completely against him. And so Hezekiah takes a fighting force, and they go about 30 miles from Jerusalem to this place called Lachish, and they start laying siege to the city of Lachish. But he sends a group of messengers to go speak to Hezekiah and the leadership team and the people of Jerusalem. And what he's going to do 
is he's going to undermine the faith that Hezekiah's words just activated in the army and in the men and the people of Judah. And I want you to see here that this is how Satan always works. As soon as God's word starts to build faith and we're ready to move forward and we're ready to trust God and we're ready to step out, Satan comes along and his goal is to undermine God's word and the effect that God's word has on our faith in God. And I'll pause here for a minute because obviously... I want to talk about how this works. I guess the best way is to talk about the parable of the soils, and I'm only going to talk about one of the four soils, but Jesus teaches us how Satan undermines the work of God. And you're going to recognize this in your own life. Look up at the screen, Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 4 three and four to see the parable, and then it's interpreted in verses 14 and 15. Jesus says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Now, verse 14, Jesus explains the parable. He says in verse 14, the sower sows the word. Well, we know that the sower is the father. And the seed is the word of God that is sown in our hearts through various means. Reading, hearing, listening to Bible studies. The word goes forth and it's it's sown. And then verse 15, he says, These are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And Jesus is saying, hey, this is what happens. The word goes out and it falls along the wayside. And the idea there is it doesn't fall into a heart that is properly cultivated and prepared to receive the word. And because of that, Satan comes and and he steals away the word that was sown in their hearts. I remember the first time I studied this, I'm thinking, how does Satan do that? You know, you you get this idea that, you know, it's like he, I don't know, I'm such a literal person, and my mind does weird things, but I get this person, I get this idea of a little demon that crawls inside my body and grabs the word and runs away with it, you know. Pray for me. (laughs) Has anybody else in here ever wondered how Satan comes and steals the word? Have you ever thought about that? And how can I protect myself? And, you know, maybe like a tinfoil hat. Ezra explains it really well here in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Look at verse 10. Remember, this is the messenger, and he's speaking to Hezekiah and to the leaders and to the people. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And don't miss that. Hezekiah just spoke to the people, activated their hearts with biblical truth. Thus says Sennacherib. It's like in the Garden of Eden. God spoke and then Satan comes along and he says, well, I got a little something different to say here. Did God really say? He says, in what do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst, saying, the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? So Sennacherib sends this messenger to say, what is the source of your hope that keeps you from surrendering? He says, if you listen to Hezekiah and you trust in your God, you're going to die of hunger or you're going to die of thirst, or you're going to die at our swords. But you're going to die. Then he goes on in verse 12, he says, Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it? What he's implying is that God is now mad at Hezekiah for Sennacherib didn't understand what 
Hezekiah had done. He had purified the land. But in Sennacherib's mind, he had taken away opportunities for the God of Israel to be worshipped. So he says, don't you realize that your God is now mad at you guys? Did you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out, their lands out of my hand? Who is there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you like this, and do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? And then verse 16, furthermore, his servants spoke against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. So I'll sum all that up. Shennacherib sends this message and he says, listen, Hezekiah told you that your God would deliver you. But I want you to look at the nations that my father and his father and his father have conquered. Every one of them thought their God was going to deliver them. And not one of those gods ever delivered them. In fact, we've just conquered every nation we've ever come against. So what makes you think that your dinky little nation is going to stand against us because you have Yahweh, who's now mad at you, right? And so he says, I'm going to conquer you because your God is unable to protect you from me. I just get the idea that when you speak about the God of the universe that way, something bad's about to happen to you. And so after undermining Hezekiah's speech by really speaking directly against Hezekiah and against the Lord, obviously they're, they're trying to undermine the faith of all the people. Now they, they use propaganda to scare the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is really interesting. Look at verse 17. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. The best Bible caller, uh, scholars say that these were probably like flyers that were sent over the wall. They somehow wrote out things that would have undermined the faith of the people. They, they got them into the city and people are reading these flyers, and the goal is that they want to breed fear in the Jewish people, and they want to scare them into surrendering. Same tactics that are used in war to this day. And look at verse 18. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and trouble them that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, the work of men's hands, or idols, in other words. And what we learn here is that Satan will use any means possible to undermine the confidence of God's people. When God's word has gone forth and people are feeling faith, they're experiencing trust in the Lord, Satan is going to do everything he can to undermine that. And it's important for you and I to recognize that when Satan's doing this, we have to know how to stand against him. And, and our example for that is Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, right after he was baptized, right? Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted. And three times, Satan undermines biblical principles, trying to deceive Jesus. And Jesus comes back by quoting scripture that was applicable to the attack that was coming against him. In other words, we have to know the word of God well enough that we can identify deception and then speak truth back. And that's the lesson that we learn from Jesus. And so interestingly enough, we get to verse 20 here and we're gonna see God defends his people. And God does take seriously the undermining of his word. You know, in, in the Garden of Eden, it led to the fall of man and, and God very seriously cursed the serpent for 
his role in undermining God's word and leading the human race into deception. And now God is going to take seriously the undermining of his word by Sennacherib and by his generals and his soldiers. Verse 20, because of this, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, prayed and cried out to heaven. So Hezekiah as king and Isaiah as a prophet recognized that God's people were in jeopardy of falling victim to their enemy's tactics. I mean, this is a very real threat. This didn't go on just one day. This went on day after day. And the people are getting weak and fear is beginning to spread. So Hezekiah and Isaiah, they pray diligently. And if you want to write this down, you could go read 2 Kings 19. There's a lot of detail that's added there and you can find other details in Isaiah chapters 36 through 39 about the prayer and the prophecies that Isaiah gave. We're not going to touch on that tonight. What I want to show you is what God did. Verse 21, then the Lord sent an angel. How many angels? One angel. All right. And I want you to see, and I just, again, I'm such a detailed person. It's not an archangel. It's not a cherubim. It's not a seraphim. As, as one of my favorite Bible teachers said, it was just a run-of-the-mill angel if such a thing exists. I fear and reverence I say that, okay? Just a, a regular angel. Bob the angel, you know. And he, he's just he's insignificant in the realm of bigger angels. But I want you to notice what one angel does. He cut down every mighty man of valor, leader, and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. Just one angel. Just think when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he he cried out and he said, man, I, I could call legions of angels to deliver me. Can you imagine what that would have looked like? But he didn't. But just this one angel just wreaks havoc, cuts down the Assyrian army. And so he returned, this is now the king, he returned shamefaced to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. And thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presented to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. What I like about this story is that God knew how much of this attack his people could endure. And before they faltered before they fell. God sends them deliverance through this angel and he rescues them. And true to his word in 2 Kings 19 where you can read about the details, God sends Sennacherib home humiliated. And although it appears it happened right away, I I think it was almost 20 years later that he was assassinated by some of his own children as he's worshiping one of his gods. But the interesting thing about this story is is what happens with the people of Judah. They respond by worshiping and, and exalting God. And there's a lesson here. You know, how often are we in some situation and we're crying out to the Lord and the Lord answers our prayer and he delivers us from, you know, a bad situation And we forget to make a big deal of that. It's it's why, like, with all of our our prayer stuff here, we've got prayer cards and we've got our Facebook prayer and praise page. We always want to hear the prayer requests and then we want to hear the praise reports when God answers because we always want God to be glorified for what he did. Well, the people of Judah, because of this great deliverance, they worship the Lord, they bring gifts to Jerusalem, But notice also that Hezekiah now is exalted in the sight of all the nations thereafter. 
all these nations are saying, don't mess with the Jewish people. You know, Hezekiah, I don't know what he did, but there were dead Assyrians everywhere, right? And Hezekiah now gets exalted. And that's not good because few men can handle the kind of fame and honor that this situation generated for Hezekiah. And in his old age, Hezekiah faltered. And we'll just skim this over. This could be a whole study in its own, but let, let's pick it up. We'll call this Hezekiah's stumble and recovery. I'm going to cover a lot of ground here, and I'm going to be leaving out some of the details, but I've taught two portions of Scripture in the past that cover this, and so I just feel like we need to keep moving. In those days, verse 24, Hezekiah was sick and near death. We read in 2 Kings that he had a boil, and it must have been severely infected, and and, and maybe, you know, his blood was infected or something. So he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him. This is God, spoke to Hezekiah and gave him a sign. Now, again, all the details are in 2 Kings 20. He's near death. He prayed. God extended his life by 15 years. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him for his heart was lifted up. That means he was filled with pride. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and over Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Now, in verse 27, we're given some of the details. These are the reasons that his heart had become filled with pride. Notice verse 27, Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. That'll lead a man to pride. He made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of desirable items. Those things are the result of pride. He had storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine, and oil, and stalls for all kind of livestock, and folds for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance. For God had given him very much property. The same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gihon and brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. So unlike the earlier days of his life, he's now experiencing prosperity that resulted in pride instead of humility. And his pride led him to make a number of foolish decisions. Verse 31, however, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. And again, this is a huge story here, but the simple details are the king of Babylon. And Babylon was just a little province of Assyria at this time. They weren't a world superpower. But the king of Babylon hears of Hezekiah's miraculous healing, that he was at death's door and that God healed him. And he, he sends a delegation. And in a sense, they're like bringing flowers and a, and a congratulations card. Glad you're better, right? And it was a gesture of goodwill. But while they were there in, Je in Judah, Hezekiah made two really serious mistakes. If you go back and you read the other portions of Scripture, he just takes them and he foolishly showed a future enemy the immense riches that Judah had. And later, Babylon would come for those riches. He showed them all of their military capability. So now, Babylon later was able to kind of size up their enemy. But the worst thing we read in other portions of Scripture is that it appears that he took credit for the things God had done. So you really defeated the Assyrians? Oh, yeah, it was nothing. Yeah, well, it was nothing for God. You weren't involved in that, you know. And so often, God does something amazing through us because he chooses to work through us and it's so important that we always give God glory. Myself and the worship team always pray for that before every single church service. Lord, let us just do your work as filled with your spirit, but we never want anybody but you to get the glory. 
And look at verse 31. It says earlier that God departed from him for a season that he might know all that was in his heart. Bible commentators kind of argue over whether that he, in verse 31, should be capitalized or not. Because God already knew what was in Hezekiah's heart. But some Bible commentators and scholars believe that it should be a a lowercase he. In other words, God allowed Hezekiah to falter and to fail so that Hezekiah himself would see what was in his heart. And it led to him realizing that his heart was filled with pride and he repented of his pride. And he was restored to the Lord. Isn't that amazing? After everything we've read of all these kings that falter in the last days of their life, here we have Hezekiah confronted with his pride, and it was actually Isaiah that came along and confronted him. He said, what what were those men from Babylon doing here? Oh, they just brought me a get well soon card. And what did you show them? All the ways the Lord has blessed us. And what else? Oh, all of our military stuff, our secret technology. And Isaiah is like, you realize how foolish that is, right? But the consequences didn't come during Hezekiah's life. It it came in the future. So this four-week study of this great man of God ends here in verses 32 and 33. And we'll look at Hezekiah's death. In verse 32, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, and I, I just can't get over this, and his goodness. Pause there for a minute. Have we read that about anybody else? Hezekiah goes down in history, in God's word, as a king whose goodness is recorded in other portions of scripture. Look at this. Indeed, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And so if you want to read more about Hezekiah, Isaiah 36 through 39 and 2 Kings 18 through 20 will add much to what we studied over the last four weeks. Verse 33, so Hezekiah rested with his fathers and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. And then this final line will lead us into next week. We won't really talk about it, but we'll jump in next week. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Is there anybody in the room that can use one word to describe Manasseh? Shout it out. Evil. I was going to say wicked. Evil's even worse, isn't it? He was evil. And here's what's interesting. If you go back and you read the account in 2 Kings, when Hezekiah was sick, Isaiah came to him and he said, get your affairs, get your house in order, for this is going to lead to death. This illness is going to lead to death. And Hezekiah turned his face away and he wept and he prayed. And it's pretty obvious what he prayed for. He prayed for a lengthening of his life. And it was during the lengthening of his life that he fell into pride, fell under the correction of Isaiah the prophet, and fathered Manasseh. And it's just one of those things where we have to look at it and say, there are times where God speaks to us and he says, listen, this is what's next. And I don't even know how to formulate this next sentence. But we pray and God changes the course of our future. And we end up creating a Manasseh. And I think the key is we we have to learn to walk in the will of the Lord and to seek him for how perfect his plan is rather than always saying, God, take this away. God, take that away. God, change this. There are some things that we are meant to walk through because when we come out on the other side, we're going to be better. 
mature. Paul used the word complete. And some of the trials that God lays before us are designed to take us to the next level. And I think we have to learn to pray God's will in the midst of trials. That's a whole different study. So let me give you four takeaways because I I think tonight's study was very impacting. At least it was for me. Four things that we can immediately apply from tonight's study. Number one, it is not uncommon for a follower of Jesus Christ to be walking in complete obedience to God and his word, prospering, and yet experience ongoing trials and tribulation. So as you go into trials and tribulation, don't always ask the question like, God, what did I do wrong? Sometimes God is going to say nothing. It's that you're doing everything right. And you are drawing the attack of the enemy. Be wise. In the midst of these attacks from the enemy, God always pours out his wisdom and his resources. The next time you're facing a new trial, stop and pray. God, give me supernatural wisdom and insight. And then, Lord, remind me to operate in sanctified common sense. If there's a hole in the wall, I don't have to pray about fixing that hole in the wall. You know? God, just give me what I need. Third thing we learned tonight is that God does hear our prayers. And he never sets us up for failure. And even though each situation is unique... God does deliver us from evil, and we have to move forward in faith, remembering God is going to deliver me from evil. And then the fourth and final takeaway, it is absolutely crucial that we remain humble. Every king that we've studied in the nation of Judah that has had a major fall at the end of their life, including Hezekiah, although he recovered from it, God did something amazing in them and through them. It led to pride and it led to their downfall. So you're going through a trial right now and you're saying, Lord, deliver me. Lord, help. Lord, fix this situation. And when God does that, it could be the turning point for what could create your downfall. So we have to be so humble when God does something, when he moves, when he uses us to do some great thing. We have got to choose humility. And when we do, God honors that. God opposes the, the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Amen? Lord, thank you for this study in the life of, of Hezekiah. In my life, Lord, the last four weeks that we have studied through his life has been really refreshing and challenging. And so tonight, Lord, we were reminded that even though we may be in a sweet spot in our relationship with you and we're learning to walk in obedience to your word, those could be the very times that we begin to draw the attack of the enemy. And a trial, a test, a tribulation comes up. Lord, we have to trust in you. We have to allow you to work. We have to ignore the voice of the enemy. We have to choose humility. And as we do those things, Lord, we are going to continue to move forward. As we do those things, Lord, we're going to grow in grace. and We're going to be mature and complete. We are going to be better prepared for the works of ministry and just daily life. So tonight, Lord, whatever we've learned in the last four weeks looking at Hezekiah, I pray that they would become part of us, that those things, those characteristics, Lord, we would take on those Hezekiah-like characteristics, Lord, that we would put off things that you've revealed in our lives, like pride or arrogance or fear, the things, Lord, that aren't going to lead us to that next step of growth. And I pray, Lord, that just in all things, we would be worshipers. Judah experienced this amazing delivery where that one angel went and just decimated the Assyrian army and they fled. Sennacherib humiliated, eventually dead. The people brought you glory 
Lord, sometimes the things that we're praying for are, are, are much smaller than that. And when the answer comes, we often forget to give you thanks and give you praise. So tonight we want to draw attention to your goodness and your faithfulness. And we want to ask, Lord, that you would continue to work in our hearts in powerful ways. And the next week, Lord, as we start to study wicked Manasseh, uh, we're going to have a lot of lessons, a lot of things to avoid. So, Lord, fill us with grace, fill us with mercy. Pray over the events of the rest of the week, Lord, that you would be glorified in the midst of them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's stand and sing our closing song, shall we? Yeah.